chapter of the Gita. It's called the Vishwarupa Darshana. Vishwa means universal. So Rupa is form. Darshana is the philosophical vision. to the personal projection that we make. Srishti means projection. Even though things are all there before us, we need an eye to look at it. The eye can be a visual eye or any of the eye of perception or all the eyes of perception. And through these eyes of perception, we see an external world. 
we are not comfortable if we cannot name and also define the concept of what goes by that name. So we name everything. And afterwards, by merely recalling the name, the form also comes. The form comes to the mind. You directly perceive this glass here. It has a form. But then we name it, this is glass. And we see something more than glass there. Here yeah, it is a glass of water. And we know that it is not full. So we say this is a glass with water three fourth or say almost full, not full. Yes, we qualify. These are all through various judgments. Every judgment is adding a new dimension to what we perceive. So this dim the judgments are coming from within us. And therefore, these new dimensions that are added to the thingness of it are supplied by us. We judge that and then our judgment becomes part of it. When Oscar Wilde said that nature copies art, it sounds very obscure. We know that art is copy nature. But how does nature copy art? To understand this, Nandraj Guru gave an example. He said, if you once read Kalidasa's Kumara Sambhava, in that there is a description of the Himalayas. Similarly, in the Rekhuamsa also, they get a similar description. And after reading the description of Kalidasa, if somebody goes and looks at Himalayas, his mind is already prepared by Kalidasa to look at it in a certain way. And he cannot escape Kalidasa's way of looking at it. That means our mind is already prepared by the artist to copy into it the nature which he wants to see. So nature as such, we do not perceive. We see it in terms of our likes and dislikes. Yesterday we went for a talk by a very eminent bishop. And he gave a very beautiful idea, a similar thing. That um, before you know a thing, you have a pre-knowledge of it. Before you judge about a thing, there is a pre-judgment about it. And this pre-judgment, he termed, is a prejudice. Although the word prejudice has a prejudicial meaning, when you take it as a prejudicial aspect, then that prejudice goes. <coughs> you are judicial free prior to an, expe an experience what is it going to be. So that collides your mind and thus there is a projection, the projection is a prejudice. Now in this chapter, there are three persons involved. 
one is Arjuna, another is Sanjaya, and then Krishna. You can say Krishna is person and also no person. But the other two people have to present themselves as two persons. And this vision is divided here between these three people. So there is a version of Arjuna, there is a version of Sanjaya, there is a version of Krishna. If you take a play of Shakespeare, and Shakespeare also comes and sits in the theater where it is enacted, or being enacted, a layman, a man who knows nothing about that play before it was presented, who is sitting next to Shakespeare, both of them are seeing the same drama, the same play. But even when the third scene comes, Shakespeare knows what is in the fourth scene and what is in the fifth scene, which the other man does not at all know. Similarly, here is a play which is going to be enacted, of which Krishna knows all the five scenes, and Arjuna does not know anything. And so he will be thrilled, he will be horrified, he will be um, considering it a great joy, a great fear, as he as it goes on opening before him. In the love scene of um, Hamlet and uh, Ophelia, <coughs> Ophelia, you may go on judging about their future, how wonderful a couple they will make and all that. But Shakespeare knows that Ophelia won't live. She will die. Similarly, so that means there is a chronological order in which things are opening. And we belong to that world. In For the Greeks, and also borrowed from the Greeks in the Christian theology, they have a concept of the chronos and the eons. The eon is an, uh, an, an eternity of time where there is no beginning and end, but everything in between the beginning and end are already transcended without any break. So it's all remaining there, and you don't have to wait for the present to go for the future to become the present and then to pass on to the past. The chronos is where you can see at one time only what is presented there. So here, two pe these two people are, you know, and <coughs> um, Sanjaya. <coughs> they had watch and witness. Whereas the other person is no person, he has not a witness. So if he sees, that is what belongs to the eons. And uh, what Arjuna sees belongs to the Kronos. And here, the total vision is called Vishwarupa Darsana, universal vision. <laughs> We have a concept of a universal person called Vishwa Nara, a universal man. When we speak of a universal man, there is an anthropomorphizing that seeing the universe in terms of the feelings, reasoning, and various faculties of man. Then you have to think of the universe as having hands and legs, 
the universe having hunger and thirst the universe wanting to have fuel to appease its hunger like that we have another concept such as narayana there is a further abstraction is made from the anthropomorphic way of looking at things where the essence is seen when the essence alone is seen so jasmine this jasmine scent is also called jasmine a rose scent is called a rose Jasmine is a flower with four petals four white small white petals or sometimes five <coughs> and a rose is a multi petal flower with a rose color and you take only the essence of it and you just call a rose color rose is also called rose So you can take one abstraction, and that abstraction refers to the whole. Similarly, when the essence that animates all men are taken into one, you call it Narayana. But when you make it more anthropomorphized, you call it Vishnara. But in the present Vishrupa. it is uh, not confined to either of this the word narayana being used in religious books especially in a theistic context as a synonym of god ishwara the word also acquired the meaning ishwara for god So that is that's a theological way of looking at things. That is a cosmological way of looking at things. Theological ways of looking at things in India was developed through stories of epics, and those epics are a kind of paraphrase, a kind of a. an elaboration made of certain ideas which are muted in the in the rigveda and what came in the rigveda were afterwards put into yajurveda and samaveda as it were is a little different it's not a little very much different so in these three vedas which are always called the tri veda we have the germs of indian theology and indian theology becomes very much illustrated just as uh, andy is illustrating our gita lesson uh vyasa and others illustrated them with parables stories and those very visual parables because they have painted with words everything which they wanted to say and thus we have already an idea of how indra looks how varuna looks how mitra looks how agni looks how geruda looks etc although these are really just simple ideas they are given an anthropomorphic look so they are also like man <coughs> in greek mythology then it the same thing ideas are changed into b for instance chronos chronos is only chronos devours all its children so time also is like that <coughs> time devours everything that is produced in time so it's an idea but then you can make a myth of it a parable of it myth has 
the great effect in fact on human mind. We hear most of the fables, fairy tales, when we are children on the age of uh, two, three, four, from our grandparents or someone who tells us nursery tales, all over the world nursery tales are told to children. And those children's minds are full of mythical figures, giants are there, fairies are there, some are very small and beautiful, some are very big and ferocious, and dragons are there. And these go to build the very first foundation of consciousness. Then you cannot escape it till the end of your life. Whatever you do, these, these are the foundations. These mythological stories which are told you when you were a small child, you can fashion it and you can elaborate it and you can give it more realistic meaning but that always remains there. That is a feeding ground of your poetry. That is the feeding ground of your <coughs> everyday life. Not to say of your dreams, your anger, your love. Yes, uh, when you are in love, when you are in anger, you are in a hypnotized state. And then this mythical anger can come to you. This mythical love can come to you. You make yourself into a Radha and Krishna. Now every woman who loves a man thinks that she is a Radha and he is Krishna. I mean in the Indian context. If it is an <coughs> Arabian love affair, every man is a Majinu. And every woman is a Laila. And in the West there can be other corresponding names with the Johnny and the Andy knows. I don't know how they feel about maybe. Romeo and Juliet, or even much deeper than that. So these mythical things which comes to become the theological version through the epic, that is, Krish uh, that is um, Arjuna's mind. When Arjuna says, I want to see your divine form, he heard about the four, four-handed Vishnu, who has in one hand a maze, in the other hand a lotus flower, and a discus, and, um, what else? Uh, and a conch shell. So that is the form he is looking for. And he had similar visions of other gods and goddesses. When he is asking for this divine vision, it's a very significant uh, suggestion coming from the Lord. He says, Arjuna, my form <coughs> is endless. So many colors are in it, and so many wonders are in it. And um, <coughs> see all these wonders, and whatever you want to see, whatever you want to see, see, that's an important thing. <laughs> you can see it. <coughs> so if um, Arjuna, which is Indian background, what he is in. The same chance was given to a Chinese. He would have seen a lot of dragons. And if the same was given to a Greek, he would have seen Poseidon and Zeus and so many other things. Sol uh, uh, Apollo and such kind of gods. So that is one vision which we are getting here. The other is a more matter of fact way of looking at the entire world being mirrored in the Lord. That is somewhat you may call the Deutrop theory. 
Then there is a dew drop on a leaf. You can see the entire world mirror in the dew drop. In the Chinese, I mean the Buddhist speak of in Indra's net. Indra's net is a number of pearls which are strung on, on threads. Some threads are running lengthwise and the other is running breadthwise. Warp and woof of threads. And on the warp and woof of thread, there are so many conjunctions. At every conjunction, there is a pearl. And that pearl, in that pearl, all other pearls are becoming reflected. So these, from these pearls are emanating uh, a multicolored world. Not really one is uh, reflecting all, the reflection is reflected into the other. And that reflection of the reflection is also reflected in the next. And thus, there are these millions and millions of pearls with which a net of space and time are interwoven, very much like a monadology of Leibniz. Leibniz speaks of monads. Monad is like an atom, but not a physical thing. Suppose it, uh, we think of an atom of an idea, an atom of consciousness. And then he, he speaks of uh, such monads which are very dull in their capacity to reflect and very transparent and clear so that it can make an exact replica of what it, it reflects, it mirrors. And then they are mutually mirroring, <coughs> mutually reflecting. The result is you find from something like a stone which is incapable of mirroring anything uh, bright enough that you can see to the monad of all monads, which he called God, that reflects everything so clearly. And that is the entire matrix of, <coughs> of monadology. A similar thing is spoken of as the, the net of Indra. And in that net of Indra, you see the cosmos reflecting in every individuated mind, every individual mind. So you are saying the same word that I am saying, because we are two mirrors, and everything is mirrored in you as a dew drop, everything is mirrored in me as a dew drop, and between us we can communicate this, because I can make my, my thoughts reflected into your mind, and you can make your thoughts reflected into my mind. At the same time, they also speak of, <coughs> say, a uh, yeah, Zen Khan, which says, um, even if something impossible like the <coughs> sky being opened up, or all the trees become animated as human beings. It is impossible for a word to convey a word from one person to convey its exact meaning to another person. So there is here a great possibility and a great impossibility put so close. One is that we communicate and the other is we never communicate properly. So completely. We think that the other person understand, but we do not know whether that person understand as we understand ourselves, or is he only thinking that he understand when he is not understanding it as we understand. And so it goes on like that. So many notes. <coughs> and 
thus to have a vision of the world, a total complete vision of the world, we can say that is the greatest paradox. For the whole to be murdered in the part, or the part to claim that now it knows the whole. Um, in mysticism, one way of um, thinking of God is that you see God face to face. God stands there in all his glory and you little humble being standing here and you are having a good look at, the, at God and you are filled with this great wonder, great joy, etc. And cursing yourself that you cannot fully understand, comprehend this wonderful vision of God because he is so vast. In a small way you can see that when you go and stand at the foothills of the Himalayas and look at all these snowy ranges, all that you can see is a little and you know that beyond it and beyond it and beyond it and beyond, behind and behind and behind, there are millions of ranges and what those ranges have, you have no idea. You are already feeling most satisfied, fulfilled with what you have seen. It is so, so fulfilling, so inspiring and even that vision is enough for you and yet you know there is much to know. This is a face-to-face -face vision of God. But there are others who think this is an impossibility. It's not an object. The very consciousness with which you are seeing things, you are now speaking of seeing the totality of that in its perfection. Your mind is already polluted with many of our petty desires and petty strives and emotions and <coughs> memories and things like that. So it's a very colored glass. The light is from behind and it is passing through that glass, a little of the light. And what comes through it as a projection, you are comprehending that as your objective world. Then how do you know the pure light which is behind it? especially in the Vedanta context, when you speak of the <coughs> um, conscious world of gross form, world of ideas, and the deep unconscious from where these being projected, that projection through the unconscious is possible because of a substratum of pure consciousness. And it is that which is emerging from that deep unconscious which becomes the pre-conscious and animates the subjective consciousness. And only those concepts being actualized in the, in the wakeful and there also it is the same light which percolates through percolates through the unconscious, through the pre-conscious, it comes out to the conscious. The reverse is not possible with the same faculties. You cannot turn the eyes back and look at the source from which the light comes. You cannot turn the mind back. What is mind after all? Mind is only a number of vivified questions, pluralized questions, pluralized memories, pluralized judgments. So those are not possible. And But one thing is possible. What is that one thing possible? Suppose the, these three screens, the unconscious, the 
subjective consciousness and the subject objective duality are so much are somewhat dissolved so to say they merge back into the original the sources of stratum and become flushed by it by that pure light then the wonder of it Uh, can make every bit of this having its own quality or the heterogeneity of the mind is merged back into the homogeneity of pure consciousness and there you are not seeing god from before but Uh, what may be called the unity vision which is god himself you are allowed to delve into it you are allowed to be absorbed into it it is called pure karma the consciousness which we have it's called abhasa abhasa chaitanya The other one is called Pratyang Chaitanya. Pratyang Chaitanya is in its pure state. When it becomes an objective, why is the consciousness? It is called Abhasa. So from the Abhasa, when it is retrieved into the Pratyang, the state is called pure. if it is pure then then it is qualityless qualities are black white big small good bad number of qualities are possible we well, we have to think of all these qualities taken away from it that means the view the vision that you get is an unconditional one then you cannot even say get it the vision that is is an unconditional vision of pure being so that is the third possibility one is seeing in the front and say i saw god with four hands or uh, in ezekiel and uh, old testament there is a vision of the prophet ezekiel that he has seen a chariot with four wheels with four animals in it and the chariot uh, rides in the clouds etc and of course on elaborating like that it's a it's a vision where he is seeing eye to eye there that is considered to be some water um, of an inferior kind of spiritual vision but if we take the significance of it then it is not inferior i mean the wonder of it with which the person the mystic is filled by is drawn to a depth from what he sees the objective is the aspect is only an occasion for him to sink into the depth of his myth and it becomes an alchemy an alchemy of a spiritual fusion that gives another quality to his spiritual vision so we have seen now a theological vision a cosmological vision and an unconditional vision in the vishurupa darshana all these three are there in fact from the most conditional kind of vision to the most unconditional our mind is transferred uh, as we go on through the whole text 
but our own mind is much worse than the mind of arjuna and we are looking for definite forms and when you start not saying that then we become confused so in the confusion what arjuna did was he put his hand on his head and cried shrieked he said oh enough enough my god please stop this i am terrified others are also not only he others are also terrified i am terrified others are also terrified so please show me your original form what is your original form he has a concept of an original form of vishnu that is vidhi shank chakra kadan pankaja unless you show it i won't be satisfied but did he show that people who read gita and who come in gita they take it for granted that he showed it but he didn't show it truly he said but what gita acharya vyasa says manusham rupam he showed only his human form that is again as the same krishna whom arjuna knew as his friend he was standing there in our own eagerness to see the theistic conditioning conditioned form we fill up the gap there when you come to the end of this chapter and we presume that the lord had shown that form no that means uh, we don't critically read the gita so these are some of the uh ideas we should bear in mind before we get into this book i mean this particular chapter madanugrahay paramam ಮಧ್ಯಾತ್ಮಸಂಜಿತಂ ಮೋಹೋಯ ವಿಗದು ಮಮ ಅರ್ಜುನ ಸೆಟ್ ಬೈ ದಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಚ್ ವಿಚ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಬಿನ್ ಸ್ಪೋಕನ್ ಬೈ ಯು ಔಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಫೇವರ್ ಫಾರ್ ಮೀ ದ ಹೈಸ್ ಸೀಕ್ರೆಟ್ ನೋನ್ ಆಸ್ ಪರ್ಟೈನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ದ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮೈ ಕನ್ಫ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ವ್ಯಾನಿಷ್ You remember that in the last chapter, Arjuna did not put any question. It was Krishna out of his own love and regard for the welfare of Arjuna. He was describing his nature. And now Arjuna became encouraged by that to put this question. Yes, he did not find exactly what he had in his mind as the supreme lord that is why he wanted to ask for that that form where man and man differs if we see 10 people around yeah where the Hindu. Of the Mimamsa school. An Advaitin. A Vishishta Advaitin. A Sankhin. A Yogi. A Jewish Rabbi. a christian scholar or priest a muslim mulla a buddhist monk of the theravada school a buddhist monk 
of the Mahayana school, a Tantric Lama, uh, a Marxist, a Protestant, and a scientist, then say the word absolute and see exactly how they visualize it. We will have so many varieties of the idea of the absolute and the Vedic Brahmana who belongs to the Mimamsa school he will have um, an inconceivable idea which becomes kaleidoscopically presenting itself through with the different phases such as of Indra for a little while I will know for a little while, ask me for a little while, Mitra for a little while. And the Advaitin will consider it as a vision from a halfway house where he has all these as a kind of a Puru Baksha to dismiss with a single idea of one con pure consciousness which is purely existing as consciousness from which can emanate all values which is not by itself any value from which can emanate all values and that, that emanation if once it happens that would be considered a phenomenological defect and Thus, each person has his own varied view. And they can fight to establish what is the true nature of the Absolute. Okay. Two of them will not agree. And if they have armies at their disposal, they will employ the armies to decide which God is the right God. Whether it is concept of Allah or concept of Vishnu or Harhara Mahadeva. This is such a difficult thing. Bhavapyauhi bhudanam Shrutau Vistarasho Maya Tatta Kamala Patracha Mahatmya Vijavyayam The origin and dissolution of being have been heard by me in elaboration from you. O Lord of Petal Life, as also your unexpended greatness. Different here the very reference to the Lord as Kamala Patraksha that shows the bias of Arjuna and each person has his own bias the angle from which he sees and he wants to see the previous chapter ended by saying it Ekamsham, just a fragment. This entire universe is elaborated. Just one fragment. What is known to us is, the world that is known to us, is only a very, very little fragment of the entire reality. And it, from that it shows the order of it. Or the reality which is now speaking here. Or voiced here through the words of Krishna. Is an unlimited truth. 
which can never be exhausted with words or reasoning. And Arjuna seemed to have not even heard that. Even if he heard it, he didn't understand it. And so he is asking for a more direct experiencing of it, but that is very correct. You may hear from the Guru that Tomasi, but even after hearing you may say, Guru, I have heard your voice, I heard what you said, but I don't see it that way. I see myself as a person with a body and mind and intellect, but you are saying I am that, which is all. I see myself as one among the many, not the all from which all have sprung up. So please help me to get to that. In uh, Chandok Upanishad, when Sveda Kedu, she asked his father about that knowing which the unknown becomes known, the uncertain becomes certain, not knowing which nothing will be certain or truly known. The father resorted to a number of experimental situations. One, he asked him to go and bring the fruit of a fig tree then he asked his son, son, cut it. Then he said, Father, I cut it. What do you see in it? I see little, little seeds. Take one and cut it. And he cut it. What do you see there? I see nothing except that little stuff. From where did or from where does a fig tree come? From this almost invisible substance. Can you visualize how that invisible substance without changing the characteristics allowing uh, allows various kinds of salts and chemicals and water from the earth to get into it, magnify it, and enable it to unfold into a stem, branches, leaves, flowers, fruits, and all through keeping the blueprint of its own characteristics so that again when it is time for it to recapitulate the essence of all its qualities back into a tiny seed so that it can be repeated until time. Do you see that? he did not say all these words. Taken for granted, his son was intelligent enough to understand by just referring to it. And his son understood. Then he said, Tattu Masi Chveta Ketu That, Tat. Tom Asi, you are that. The same principle is in you also. You are also this substance from which everything, the whole world which you conceive, for which you see, becomes elaborated. And he thought this one example won't help, because that gives only one shade of meaning. So he asked him to bring a pitcher of water and a 
big lump of salt you asked it to put it in the, the water keep it away when he was asked to bring it and said take the salt back you put a lump of salt into the water I want it now take it out so he stirred it he looked into it he said father I cannot see it now I do not know what happened to it I kept it in this water but it is not there now how come you have seen a lump of salt has a form has a mass it is heavy you could touch it hold it you put, you also put it there and you don't see anything but water now where is it gone then he was asked to touch on the surface and put on his tongue he said i taste salt put your finger in the side and taste it it is salty put it underneath put it dip it and taste it yes it's salt so the salt is now everywhere in all the, mo- the salt molecules has so much intermixed with the water molecules that you don't say it is all pervading then is it that the nasi in the first one it was the elaboration of the essence in a seed into a, an objective tree that was taken as an example now it is the other way a material concrete thing has gone back into a subtle state a reverse order is explained thus he takes 10 or 15 or 16 examples one after another each one to sub to complement the meaning of the previous one but all going back to the same subject that tamasi sheda ke to there is a need for experiential understanding theoretical and understanding is one thing experiential understanding arjuna says let me have an experiential understanding what he said i believe he says i fully believe what you said but i, I still have to experience it ಮೇದ್ಯಥಾತ್ಮಾನರಮೇಶ್ವರ ದ್ರಷ್ಟುಮಿಚ್ಛಾಮಿ ದೇಮೈಶ್ವರ ಪುರುಷೋತ್ತಮ ಸೊ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸೆಡ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸುಪ್ರೀಮ್ ಲಾಡ್ ಐ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಯುವರ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಫಾರ್ಮ್ ಓ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಪರ್ಸನ್ Here is the word Aishwaram Purushottama. He calls here Krishna Parameshwara. Ishwara means Parameshwara. It is that reality which rules controls maneuvers a thing from within the word ishvara is derived from it there is an atomic principle within the atom which keep the electrons move around the proton and that is the yeet the ishvara within the atom and thus there is an Ishwara in everything within the solar system there is a field operation of various kinds of gravitational pulls 
treatment we call it the solar system which puts each planet into its orbit that you call the ishvara the planet system there is in the heart a certain principle by which the blood is made to circulate these are autonomous systems and each system can be called an ishvara but when you take all such systems there is a uniformity in the law that operates that uniformity is called parama ishvara and so she calls him parama ishvara but arjuna probably was not meaning it with some that philosophical attitude and he was thinking of a atheistic concept of a god as a, as a supreme creator as a supreme benefactor and i want to see the your aishwaram your godly form मन्यसे यदि दच्छक्यम् मया दृष्टमिदि प्रभो योगेश्वरं ददो मे त्वं दर्शयात्मनमव्ययम् इफ यू थिंक दैट इट इज पॉसिबल फॉर मी टू सी इट ओ पावरफुल वन देन डू यू ओ योग मास्टर शो मी you are never decreasing self say the yogeshwara aspect of here a yogi is also considered as one who has siddhis a yogi can present many siddhis many of his um, Uh, any mother cries, so to say. Then you can say it is a yoga chira, vipava, or vipodi, chamatkara. Many, many words are there. But in an ultimate sense, to be a yoga chira is your own kaivalya. पश्चिमे पार्थरूपाणी शोधसहस्रश मनाधा दिव्या मनावर्णाकृती पशादिवसूनुद्रा अश्विन मरदस्तथा बहुवन्यदुष्टपूर्वाणी पश्चाचर्याणि पारदा कृष्ण सेट बिहोल्डो पार्था माय फॉर्म्स बाय हंड्रेड्स एंड थाउजेंड्स वेरीड इन काइंड डिवाइन एंड ऑफ वेरीड कलर्स एंड शेड्स बिहोल्ड द आदित्यस द वसुस द रुद्रस द टू अश्विनस एंड आल्सो द मरुस बिहोल्ड मेनी मार्वेल्स नेवर सीन बिफोर ओ भारदा Sir Jinas background is of the Vedas when he speaks of Ishvara god the archetypal forms which are in his mind are of the Varunas the Adityas the Maris and the Ashwin and he said you may see all those things of which you speak behold many marvels never seen before डिस 
Okay. When you want to see, you can see it. I was um, copying a, a part of a picture of Yeshar, which he calls the the fish with the scales. But if um, you are a little projective and look at the scales, you can see each scale is a form. Every scale, there are a number of fish forms here. There are also forms of people lying down, birds flying, horses galloping. All these are there. If you want to see it, you see it. It all depends on what you want to see in this world. If a man goes to a town and he wants to see the taverns there, he sees that. If you want to see the philosophers of the town, he sees only the philosophers. If you want to see dramas, he sees the drama. If you want to see the banker, you will see the bank. So how there is a priority in our mind. And according to that you see. Nadumam chakyase drishtum mane naiva sa chachusha divyam dadamide chachuhu pashyame yoga maishwaram But if you are unable to see me with this your human eye I give you a divine eye. Behold my sovereign yoga. So we need another eye. We need means Arjuna needs another eye. Krishna says, the kind of thing which you want to experience, you cannot see with this eye of yours. So people speak of third eye. I think one man wrote a book called The Third Eye. And they say now an operation can be made here between the eyebrows so that a third eye can be developed. Such is this funny world. And we accept all such things. I sometimes get letters that uh, the third eye is opened in them, giving a lot of trouble. It has become pathological to have the third eye. But what is this Jnana Chakshus? And the word itself is Jnana Chakshus. When a Christian is, when a man is baptized and made a Christian, baptism with water, that is called jnana smanam. Baptism with water. What is baptism? How can a person have a smana with jnana? Jnana means wisdom. To be purified with his wisdom, to be bathed in wisdom. Not bathe just with water. But if you take it only the ritual part of it, you don't see by sprinkling water on a person's head or making him dip in water that he becomes purified. So that's only an external symbol. As a corrective, Jesus added. Baptism with fire and the Holy Spirit. When you say baptism with water, people think it's so easy, I can pour a bucket of water on my head. Baptism with fire, it's a little more troublesome because you may be burnt. So how do you have a baptism with fire and then still 
baptism with the Holy Spirit. Friends, um, I saw a very peaceful church and I was very much drawn to it. I went there, I sat there and I felt a great peace. And when I was sitting, enraptured by that peace, the priest of that church was astonished to see a stranger sitting, not as others pray, but sitting in his, in a lotus pose and uh, is meditating. So he came and asked me, you belong to this church? I said, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, you are a Catholic? I said, yes. Uh, you are a, a Roman Catholic? I said, no, I am not a Roman Catholic. I am a Catholic, and I belong to this church. So I said, that is very strange. I said, it's not strange. What is strange is to say Roman Catholic. Catholic means a universal person. A Roman means local fixed to Rome. A person cannot be local fixed to Rome and also be universal. So to say Roman Catholic is uh, a strange word. And he said, you are a Hindu. <laughs> you must be a Hindu, otherwise you won't say that. What I mean is, are you a baptized Christian? I said, baptized with water or fire or Holy Spirit, which do you mean? He said, come away, let us have tea. So. <coughs> He didn't want to get into a controversy there. Uh, this idea is this. To be baptized with water, that means at a very vital emotional level, you have to be purified. And because that is the, the depth and you have to be purified in the sense that your reasoning is to be restructured. The test of fire is that you cast gold into fire, gold purifies it. Our reason has the flames of a, of a fire. So you bring everything to reason, it tests it. And thus you should be have such a reasoning by which you can discriminate between true and untrue, nitya, anitya, vastu, viveka. And then you have purification at the spirit level. So these are the three successive baptisms. Similarly, to have a jnana chakshus, the, what you see with this chakshus, how is it termed? It's called ajnana. What is ajnana? According to Vedanta, to see this world is ajnana. Because we have gone away from the original consciousness, which may be called the Turiya. From the Turiya, you have gone into the Sushupti, into the Sapma, into the Jagrat, which um, the horizontalization became more and more until it became fully horizontalized to have subject-object duality. And where all these are reduced, only where there is a reduction possible, total reduction possible, you can say now you have a jnana chakras, where the jnana can be reduced. The world of forms and names, Mama Rupa, 
the theory of perception in Western psychology is very simple that an object it is outside the body. In the body there is a faculty of vision. That's an organ which has an external sight and it has an area in the brain, in the visual area. And then the light which is received at the retina by the rods and the cones, um, they are provoked and there is a whole series of occurrences are mentioned how there is an encoding of the form and the color which are transmitted to the visual area of the brain and that is according to that encoding a conscious a replica comes in the consciousness or consciousness is formulated as a replica of what is encoded and then you say it you say to put it in a very simple way but it's a very very elaborate process even for the physiologist to explain this but here this stimulus is coming from the external object to the organ with the eye now with, the, with the light according to the variance in the frequency of the light waves that travel from an object to the eye you see colors but the Vedantins think it this way nothing is uh, broken there is one total consciousness which has no rupture anywhere and this he calls Akhanda Chit Shakti or Chit Vilas. there is one Chit one pure consciousness is unbroken and within that consciousness is circumcised where it is um, held a prisoner by a network of the <coughs> nervous system of the body and the indriyas and the mind and pain pressure mechanism of what has now become a jiva. In an unbroken there is a circum limiting. This can be somewhat um, uh, analogous to the dipping of a pot in the ocean. As ocean, water is not broken anywhere in the ocean, but there is a pot in it. And so the same ocean in, in is in the pot also. But because of that upadhi or condition of a pot there, Technically, the water in the pot is a pot of water. So you cannot call it ocean, even though it is still in the ocean, and there is no discontinuity for the water in the pot from the ocean, but because of this conditioning of the pot. So somebody breaks that pot, that technicality is gone, that conditioning is gone. So now you say, a pot of water and an ocean of water. There's a kind of a duality there. And here we call 
the akhandatva is called it has become chinna chinna means broken parichinna in a specific way it is broken parichinna chaitanya so the chaitanya which was nurvishesha now becomes a vishishta chaitanya how in a parichinna manner in a in a specially broken way so it's called parichinna vishishta chaitanya here is an object so the objectivization the object part of it makes the same consciousness broken and that has taken the form of tad aakara vritti of that particular object in the present case is a pot say khada aakara vritti khada vishishta aakara vritti or khada vishishta chaitanya and i have become ahankara vritti chaitanya aham kara ainas that has become khada kara vritti chaitanya but chaitanya is common there there is homogeneity and so the consciousness in me which i call me as it can easily enter into the consciousness which is of the pot there can be a modulation a transformation of what is this moment i ahankara vritti to be that vastu aakara vritti vishaya aakara vritti vishaya vishishta aakara vritti and this is called perception so perception is temporarily forgetting yourself and allowing the very stuff of your own consciousness to be modulated into that but the very next moment you know that you are the perceiver of the pot so this is explained as like a bee which is flying at a no the fluttering of the wing of a bee which is going at a very great speed where you cannot say now the the wing is up or the one or down it is so fast that you cannot say whether it is up or down similarly between the bhasya and the <coughs> that is the bhana ashraya and the person who is seeing it the subject and the object there is a rapid oscillation of the same consciousness in its modulation one moment it is the opposition and the next moment not next moment within the moment itself it is the subject and this is called abhasa vritti and because of the abhasa vritti everything that you wish like is you are tampering with the original reality of the self and therefore it is considered as ignorance now to see suddenly all these millions and millions of forms are lifted and through that you are seeing the untransformed pure consciousness that is the 10000 suns which are lighting all at once this one sun which has caused so much of trouble for us it has given all these millions of variegated forms you need another 10000 suns here which to take away to correct every projection that is made every conditioning that is made every breaking up of pure consciousness that is made and that is called akhanda chaitanya or it is a it does not come by pratyaksha because in the pratyaksha you are seeing only physical perception 
the guru gives only paroksha because he is telling you that it is not so but when you yourself find that the screen is lifted it is not pratyaksha not paroksha but aparoksha and it's called aparoksha anupodi not by reasoning but by anupodi anupodi you have become that it come what what originally you were where there is sarupa siddhi you call it an impurity so that is a big um, controversy about anubhava whether anubhava can be considered as valid because you become bhava ಶಿರಸಾಹೇವೃಣಮ್ಯಶಿರಸಾಹೇವೃಣಮ್ಯಶಿರಸಾಹೇವೃಣಮ್ಯಶಿರಸಾಹೇವೃಣಮ್